I'm going to read to about 15 and pick up the rest later. It says, And He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. Now, a couple of weeks ago, before I got sick, the last message I taught on, or the lesson we taught on, was unity. And being unified, and lo and behold, we've all gone through a little bit in the last few weeks. So we all come to the union of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, and unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children. Paul said, when I became a man, I put away childish things. Tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, I mean, you know, love can be stern sometimes. <laughs> sometimes it feels downright mean. Ever heard those say those prisoners always tell you, man, I had a mean mama, you know, I don't know how I wound up in here. That mean mama was trying to love them. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. You may be seated in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I just leave you up there for the rest of the night if you kept going. You ever been told that you need to grow up? Really, has anybody ever told you that? Just raise your hand if you've ever been told that. At some point. Or let's do it this way. Have you ever told somebody they need to grow up? <laughs> and we've at least heard it. But what does that phrase imply? And I, I'm going to open this up for a moment. Just, just throw something at me. What, what does that mean? Put it being childish. Stop like a baby, childish. Get a job. Get a job. Be the Yeah, be the be the be the bigger brother you're supposed to be. Okay. Uh, Y'all just hit everything I had written down there. <laughs> this term this term isn't used if it happens on a rare occasion, right? There's, there's a difference between letting your hair down and having a little fun, being a little silly. But it's usually used on that individual that is just constantly, and forgive me, my phone was not turned down. That's my real return. <laughs> yes, sir, we'll sign we get home. Jesus didn't go nowhere, y'all, I promise. <laughs> right. So normally it's a term used when there's a pattern. And, and that we use that term, and, and different ones use that term to describe someone's state of mind in relation to their years of experience. <coughs> you know? By now, you should be. You know, by now, you know, we live in a country that has given away to a 30-year-old man still living under his mama's roof playing video games and addicted to internet porn in the basement. And we would all look at that situation and say, man, you need to grow up. You need to get a job. You need to get your own place. And the Scripture comes to mind that you need to leave your mother and father's house, get a wife, and cling to her. That's what the Bible teaches us. That's, that's when a man grows up. Instead, we have a generation where Couple gets married and lose them with mom and dad for a little while. Or forget that. We're in a generation where they just shack up with mom and dad for a little while. And, you know, then mom and dad have that difficulty of kicking them out because they've been there for four years and still ain't got a job. What causes that type of immaturity? Throw it at me. A refusal to grow up. Yeah. Lack of discipline. Lack of discipline. Don't feel like it. Laziness. Easy street, laziness. 
What about lack of, what about poor parenting? What about overprotective parenting? It's like two extremes. What about lack of responsibility? We heard that one. Uh, what was that? Enabling. Enabling, right? Because they're overprotective. You know, kid, you get the midnight call and he's in the jail and still let me spend the night like he should. Guy go bail him out. And what do you wind up doing the rest of his life? Bailing him out. I've got family. Uh, we probably all have family. That one, <laughs> that one individual. So the question is, what's missing? We've said lack of this. Lack of discipline. Lack of responsibility. Lack of desire. Lack of purpose. Lack of poor parenting. Lack of good parenting. Overprotectiveness. Basically a lack of letting go and letting grow. These are all things that are missing. Now consider the church as a whole. As a whole. It's over 2,000 years old. Does it act its age? With the gifts and authorities that have been provided, are we as mature as we should be? What's missing? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. We read in the King James. And I, and she pulled that back up while I read. I want to read to you what the complete Jewish Bible says. Now, in list of fivefold ministry in 11. And then it says what their task, this is, this is what the complete Jewish Bible says, it says their task, the Bible ministry, their task is to equip God's people. To equip them for the work of service that builds the body of the Messiah. Until we arrive, <coughs> so we're building until we arrive at the unity of, Implied by trusting and knowing the Son of God at full manhood. At the standard of maturity set by the Messiah's perfection. We have an image and we have a pattern and we have an example of a bishop in Jesus Christ. We can look at each other and excuse ourselves. But we can't look at Jesus and excuse much. In the King James Version, instead of saying their task is to equip God's people, it says for the perfecting. Their job is for the perfecting of the saints. God gave the gift of the fivefold ministry to the church to perfect it. And this word uh, perfect is, help me now, I'm not, I'm not Greek or Jewish or Hebrew, but katar tismos, if anyone cares. It means complete furnishing. For the complete furnishing of the saints. It means, uh, it comes from a word that means complete thoroughly. It also means to repair, to adjust, to mend, to prepare or restore. He gave us a five-fold ministry for the repairing of the saints. For the mending of the saints. For the restoring of the saints. For the furnishing of the saints. The job is full. It's a long list. And it didn't take one, it took five. It didn't take one gift to take care of the church. He said it's going to take five gifts to take care of the church. One man can't do it all. It's not possible. He didn't design it that way. That's what's wrong with the Pope. Not that Pope. But the Papal. We have a system that's pointed at one man. And that one man is supposed to do it all. But that's not God's design. Okay, five. So let's, let's understanding this. How about us? How long have you been in the church? Five years? Brother Derek would say, I've been born again since <coughs> January. It's been five months since he's been born again. You've been in and around the church, but born again, five months. Five months. Five years, ten years, twenty years, thirty years in the church. Do we act our age? Mm -hmm. 
Or do we need to grow up? Growing up is hard to do. <laughs> when people walk into our lives, can they say, God is in you of a truth? When they visit the sanctuary and we're worshiping and the Word's going forth, can they say, God is in this place of a truth? The way they did in the book of Acts. Can they say that? And if they can't, we need to ask ourselves, what's missing? I was riding down the road a couple of days ago. I had the radio on. There's an older lady speaking, AFR. She was ministering in a pastor's summit. And all I heard was one phrase, and I forgot everything else she said. 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 1 through 10. It talks about a king named Josiah when at 8 years old he took the throne. 8. Judas 10. What's Jeremiah? 11, 12. How old is that? 8 years old and took the throne. <laughs> and he reigned 30 and 1 years in Jerusalem and his mother name was and we'll skip all that and get to verse 2 and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of David his father and turned not aside to the right or the left he stayed right down the road he was supposed to be on and it came to pass in the 18th year that the king sent for Shaphan the son of Azaliah help me Lord Jesus and the son of Meshalom, the scribe, to the house of the Lord, say, go up to Hilkiah the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people, and let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord, and let them give it to the doers of the work which is in the house of the Lord, to... Repair the breaches of the house. Verse 6. Unto the carpenters and builders and masons and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. Skipping to verse 8. And Hilkiah, this is it. And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law. Guess where it was? It was in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. Do you understand what that implies? That the Word of the Lord, somehow the Word of the Lord went missing in the house of the Lord at some point. When the Word is missing in the house. It's His house. It's His Word. But His Word was missing. Now He found it in the house. But while it was in the house, no one could see it. They couldn't touch it. It wasn't tangible. It wasn't visible. <coughs> It didn't manifest itself in any way. And somehow no one realized that it went missing. They disregarded the Word to the point to where they could no longer find the Word, didn't care about it, till finally a king comes along and says, hey, we need to repair the breaches in the house. So not only did the Word go missing, but the house went in disrepair. The breaches meant the damaged places in the house of the Lord. It was so discarded and so uncared for and unkept that it began to get dilapidated. But what happened first? The Word went missing. And the house went dilapidated. But as soon as Josiah the king said, hey, what's wrong with us? We need to repair the house. And he, gave, he took money to the people and they agreed. We need, they got a whole division. We need to repair the house. They start repairing the house of the Lord. Next thing you know, some guy, oh, there it is. It's the Word of the Lord in the house of the Lord. All this time, and we walked right at the top of it. We never did see it. And so then the next question that came to my spirit was, how did the Word of the Lord 
Or how did the house of the Lord become breached? What brought the damage? Listen, 2 Kings chapter 22, verses 11 through 20 came to pass. When the king had heard the words of the book of the law, that he rent his clothes. That was a sign of mourning and repentance. He just, oh dear God, rent his clothes. I can't believe this. Tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and a few other guys. Verse 13, he said, Go ye, inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of, his, of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according unto all that which is written concerning us. What happened? The people stopped hearkening or obeying the word of the Lord in the house of the Lord until they just neglected the word, neglected the house. It became disrepaired. Over 3,000 years and not a whole lot's changed. The word of the Lord and the house of the Lord should be stepping out into the world and changing the world, but instead, the world is stepping into the church and changing the church. We're not supposed to become like the world to reach the world. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth and the light of the we're supposed to be the light. What's up? What do you do with the light? You look for the light when you're in darkness. You grope in the darkness until you find light, and then you head that way. But if the light is trying to reach the dark, and it starts dimming so that it can, who is going to make it back to where the light originated? It won't be long before the light's gone. And then you're all in complete darkness. James chapter 1, verse 19 through 26. Therefore, my brothers, and I'm going to read from the complete Jewish Bible. I'm doing that a lot tonight, but sometimes it just makes it plain. Therefore, my dear brothers, let every person be quick to listen. What does it stay there now? Sometimes we talk too much. That's just to shut up. Ooh, Pastor said, shut up. Be quick to listen. Slow to speak. Slow to get angry. The Bible says that a soft answer turns away wrath. You know what our old nature teaches us? If somebody bows up at you, you bow right back up. But what the Word teaches, when He bows up at you, you just get gentle and soft. Is everything all right? And then the bowed up guy has no place to go. For a person's anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. So rid yourselves of all vulgarity and obvious evil. Receive meekly the word implanted in you that you can save your lives. Don't this and here it comes. Don't deceive yourselves by only hearing what the word says. I like this version better. But do it. Yes, there are some churches who have replaced the word of the Lord with philosophy and psychology, and the truth is completely missing. But even in spirit filled, Jesus' name, born again, one God, tongue talking churches, there's something missing from the house of the Lord, and it is the application of the word of the Lord and the believer. We hear it. We know it. But most of the time we don't do it. Especially if the doing means operating on myself. Come on, come on. 
We hear it, we know it, but we don't apply it. Because growing up is hard to do. Nobody said it's going to be easy. James chapter 1 verse 23 says this, For whosoever hears the word but doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror. That's me. Who looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what he looks like. I don't know. Maybe he looked in there and well, so saw John Wayne. <laughs> and then you come back and you walk away thinking... Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Forgetting completely. You're going to look nothing like John Wayne. You might be a little homely. <coughs> but he walks away from the mirror completely forget what he looks like. But if a person looks closely into the perfect Torah, which gives freedom and continues becoming not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work it requires. Then he will be blessed in what he does. Anyone who thinks he is religiously observant, but does not control his tongue, is deceiving himself, and his observance counts for nothing. You can look the part, but if you can't control your tongue, you're not the part. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. you, you can have all the works down pat. The, you know, the outward could be down pat. But the Bible said there was white as scepters and basically rotten men's bones on the inside. Rotten to the core. But you look good on the outside. So what work... It says there's a work required. A doer of the work it requires. What work? Now we have to go back to Ephesians. This is where we're jumping to 21 through 31. I've already gone longer than a long ago. You ready to find out what we got to do? Because growing up is hard to do. Here's how you grow up. If you really listen to Him, and again, I'm reading from the complete Jewish Bible. If you really listen to Him and were instructed about Him, then you learn that since what is in Jesus is truth, then so far as your former way of life is concerned, you must strip off your old nature. So who's going to do that? You are. How do I get rid of my old nature? You strip it off. God ain't just going to come rip it all over the world. You have to do it. He said, I've not given you a spirit of love, but of power, and not a spirit of fear, but of love, power, sound mind. That sound mind means discipline. That means you've got to do it. He's given you a disciplined mind, but you've got to discipline it. You must strip off your old nature because your old nature is thoroughly rotted by its deceptive desires. Alright, so verse 22, you got to strip off your old nature. Get the lacquer or the paint there, and what you got to get, strip it off. Verse 23, you must let your spirits and minds keep being renewed. Now I'm going to say something here, and I'm going to say something else later, and I'm not contradicting, I'm showing you two extremes. How do you renew your mind? How do you renew your spirit? The Bible says that we build up our most holy faith praying in the Holy Ghost. And we learn in Corinthians that praying in the Holy Ghost means praying in other tongues. If you do not pray in tongues, then you are not building up your faith. So the longer you go between prayer meetings and speaking in other tongues, the shorter and lesser and more tired your faith becomes. But if you would pray till you break through, 
Push yourself to break through the Spirit. Pray in other tongues and stay there a while and let your Spirit uh, communicate with you and, God, you and God. And it tells us that intercession and praying in the Spirit, when you're in that mode and you're praying in the Spirit, you're praying the perfect will of God. You're praying the most perfect type of prayer other than thanksgiving that you can pray. You're more in the will of God praying in tongues and interceding than you are at any other point according to the Word of God. So we need to pray until we break through speaking in other tongues and then just stay there. I'm talking about our, I'm talking about our personal life. We come together, there's going to be moments of tongues and moments of English and moments of... I don't want anybody to walk in here and think they walked into a Chinese laundromat. <laughs> so here we see you got to let your spirits and minds keep being renewed. 24 says this, Clothe yourselves with the new nature created to be godly, which expresses itself in the righteousness and holiness that flow from the truth. So when you get into a relationship with truth, when you're connected to the Spirit of truth, which is the Spirit of God, which was in Jesus, which Jesus is, he said, I am the truth, the life, and the way. When you're connected to the Spirit of truth, holiness and righteousness just kind of flow out of you. There are things that never have to be taught. If I can teach you how to get into a relationship with God, if I can teach you how to get into a Holy Ghost prayer meeting and stay there a while and work on you and don't worry about everybody else, work on you. You can stay there like God where you can get connected to Him. It there's going to be a holiness that starts flowing out of you. And you won't have to go up and say, you're not supposed to do this, and you can't wear that, and you can't do this, and you can't go there, and you can't... No, you, you won't want to. You won't have to read it. And the Spirit of God, that truth you're connected to, will say, mm, I don't feel good about that situation. I'm going to stay away. Well, the Bible tells me I can't do certain things. TVs weren't invented back then. Hollywood wasn't around back then. Um, pot houses. I mean, I've been some, but I don't know. I call them something else. There's certain things. Bars. Some things are common sense, but then there's some things that truth tells you to stay away from. Get away from, get away from them. It's not good for you, son. Get away from That's a trap before you even walk into it. Verse 25. Therefore, stripping off falsehood, let everyone speak truth with his neighbor because we are intimately related to each other as parts of a body. Speaking truth with his neighbor, stripping off falsehood. You know what drives me bananas? When I have a conversation with a saint or a brother or even a pastor friend, and we're having a conversation, and I will ask a direct question, and I get this kind of escaping calls answer. It's an answer that's not an answer at all. Or it's half the truth. Or, oh, I gave them so much truth, but not all the truth. Then you're telling a falsehood because you're leading them to believe something that's not true. Rather, you say, I'd rather not talk about that. I can't answer that. I don't feel comfortable answering that question. Then for me to throw some answer that's partially halfway true, because you know what a lie is? It's not a convincing lie unless there's a little truth in it. You got a white bucket of paint. You take that one little black drop of paint, and drop it in there, you stir it up. The white's no longer pure, but you can't tell the black's in there. That's the most convincing lie there is. It's just enough truth with a little darkness in it that's convincing. Because if it's just bold evil, we're going to be like, no, man, I'm no part of that. But if it looks good and it tastes good and it smells good and it feels good, and we don't see what's on the other side of it. We might participate in that. A falsehood. So when somebody asks you something, especially your brother, your sister, or your pastor, asks you a question, don't jump and skirt and run over here because that just tells me, okay, they're hiding something. They're just not very comfortable. So I'm going to pull away. But who are you going to trust? Now I realize if you open up to somebody and they get out there on the 411 and tell the 911 everything that happened in the 211, then obviously you may not want to give that pretty good. If what they ate for breakfast is on Facebook, 
You may not want to buy the person. We could do a Facebook series instead of a redneck series. We might be a Facebook junkie. Verse 26. This is a good one. Oh, I love the way the complete Jewish Bible says this. Be angry, but don't sin. How many of you been angry this week? How many of you was angry last week? For those of you that raise your hand, the altar's right here. Okay. Be angry, but sin. Don't sin. Don't sin. I mean, you're going to get angry, but, but don't sin. <coughs> but listen to what it says. Don't let the sun go down. This is what the complete Jewish Bible brings in. Don't let the sun go down before you have dealt with the cause of your anger. Mm. And look at, look at verse... Look at verse 27. Otherwise, you leave room for the adversary. So if you go to bed without dealing with the cause of the situation that made you angry, you're going to open a door for enemy to step right into your situation. What happens? Bitterness shows up. Opinions show up. Judgment shows up. Nobody's looking at the silver lining anymore. They're just looking at the dark, nasty cloud and can't see the gold in the middle. Everything's negative and dark. Don't let the sun go down before you have dealt with the cause of your anger. It's good to pray in the morning. Get up and talk to God before you do anything else. But it's also good to talk to God before you go to bed and clean house. So you don't give place for your in, for, for the enemy to plague your soul all night long. I, I believe and know it to be true that there are spirits that war over your vessel in the middle of the night while you go in Betty by. And who's going to win is the one the one we left the most room for. Because growing up's hard to do. <laughs> Verse twenty-eight. I hope you remember that for a long time. The thief must stop stealing. Instead, he should make an honest living by his own efforts. This way, he will be able to share with those in need. Remember the, uh, the Zacchaeus went up the tree? Jesus came, followed up with him, went to his house. He repented and said, I want to repay all that I stole in like five points, seven, four, 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 five, seven, something like that. It was still more than he did. It was more than he took. And so that's kind of self-explanatory. Verse 29. Let no harmful language come from your mouth. I'm just going to take a seat for a second. Y'all tell me what's harmful language. Profanity is the easy Dig deeper. Threads. Hello, gossip. <laughs> Hello, backbiting. Be Belitt condemning, belittling, talking down to somebody. Yeah. Holier than thou, talking. Harmful language comes from your mouth. Only good words that are helpful in meeting the need. Words that will benefit those who hear them. Does gossip really benefit anybody? Backbiting really benefit anybody? Does me walking into a room and pointing out everything wrong with it really benefit anybody when I can point out everything that's wrong but I overlook all the work that's been done? Now, I'm going to tell you something. I mudded this thing and sand, my wife sanded this thing. I started to say I sanded but she sanded it. And I can look up there and see all the places I didn't do a good job. And, and now some of you have never noticed and you're looking and seeing all my stuff. I didn't say it. We can walk over here and muddy. That guy was blind when he was mudding this. You look on the walls. You know what happened? We had somebody said they'd take care of it because I'm not a mudder and they backed out on me and then I had to just do the best I could. So you can come in here and talk about how horrible a mud job that is. 
and distract yourself completely from the purpose of what's going on around you. Come on. Or you can stop and say, man, I heard this place used to be a house of witchcraft and now they're worshiping God in here. I don't care what it looks like. Is the word of the Lord missing in the house of the Lord? Mm. Don't cause grief to God's Holy Spirit, for He has stamped you as His property until the day of final redemption. Verse 31. Here's the fun part. Get rid of all bitterness. This stuff don't go easy, God. It's way down up in there. It hurts when you tug on it. Rage. Anger. Violent assertiveness. You know, when you're not being heard, you feel like, well, bless God, somebody going to hear me today. Hey, I said! <laughs> okay, you got our attention. What do you have to say? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> I completely forgot what I was I just felt like I wasn't being included, so I had to get loud. Violent assertiveness and there it is again, slander, along with all spitefulness, revenge, vengefulness. What does they get rid of it? So why don't we all have a nice bookshelf at home that had a trophy case of all of our bitterness? Come on now, that pet thing over here we like to pet on that you talk about every time you meet somebody new, you gotta go back 20 years and talk about how somebody did your family wrong or did you wrong or did your kids wrong. You're still bitter. If you're still talking about it, you're still bitter. If you still feel emotion when you talk about it, and you feel anger rise up in your spirit when you talk about it, then you're still bitter. You have not forgiven them. And think about how much you have not been forgiven of all those years that you've held on to that. Because he said, if you do not forgive your brother, then I will not forgive you. <coughs> And when he said, when he when they asked him to teach him how to pray, he said, pray like this. And then he goes on to say in that one line, Father, forgive us of our trespasses. Forgive us of our trespasses. No, I'm sorry, forgive us of our trespasses against you. As we forgive others of their trespasses against us. So basically, we're, we're praying and setting our own trap. Because we're saying, God, you've only got to be as merciful to me as I am to my brother. My sister or my neighbor or my Or that evil woman. Mm, that's hard to do. But just because growing up is hard to do doesn't justify remaining an infant in your walk with God. Where did that word come from? Complete Jewish Bible. Ephesians 4.14 We will then no longer be infants tossed about by the waves and blown along by every wind of teaching at the mercy of people clever in devising ways to deceive. You've heard me say this before, and I'll say it again. One of the most damnable doctrines in the church, period. I'm really desperately trying to get the dog. I got it. Thank you. Thank you. And they're off. I can't see him. Y'all are awesome. You just try to get up on One of the most damnable doctrines in the entire planet. There's a few of them. But one of them is that once saved, always saved. Mm. Once saved, always saved. <clears throat> but whether we want to admit it or not, it's just as much a problem in the Pentecostal church as it is anywhere else. What are you talking about? We don't believe that. Yeah, you do. When you've been to church 20 and 25 and 30 years and you still don't pray, you don't forgive, you don't give, you don't restore, 
You don't. You 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 just say whatever you feel good and ready. Your flesh wants to say. You just let it have its way. Not the spirit has its way. Let my flesh have its way. And then you think you're okay because 20 years ago you repented, got baptized in Jesus' name, and spoke in tongues when the Holy Ghost came. <coughs> you believe once saved, always saved. But that's not what my Bible teaches me. It says we've got to die daily. We've got to repent daily. Hey, the preachers got in trouble. Demas, just ask Paul. Demas was a preacher of the gospel and he backslid on God. Backslid on the apostle. A preacher. And he backslid. Yeah, it happens. Why do I got to pray now? And I said earlier that we should pursue breaking through and praying in tongues. And I'll live by that till I die. I'm shocked at the Pentecostal and Apostolic Church they go into and some people haven't prayed in tongues in years. And I'm not picking on nobody. I'm talking about the, the thing as a whole. And the times I've had to go in and preach how breaking through and staying in the Spirit rejuvenates and builds your faith. And I'm, I'm just preaching the Scripture that's been here the entire time and we've completely overlooked the Word of the Lord was missing in the house of the Lord concerning praying in tongues. And so the body's not functioning quite like it should because it's missing a valuable piece. But at the same time, I've also been in churches where they're standing on the platform praying in tongues and singing their songs and after church they step off and get with their buddies go into the Sears Roebuck store walk up with one suit put on a new suit walk right back out and Sunday night they stand on the platform in a stolen suit and sing. None of those guys except for one is in church today. One of them actually appeared with a voice was given his voice to God. And he shows up on the voice. I wonder why. Because the word of the Lord was missing in the house of the Lord. He refused to grow up. You can pray in tongues and learn to tap through in the Spirit very quickly. And sometimes in your flesh you can learn tongues. And I'm sorry, but the devil has a tongue too. So, so then what, what's, what's the deal then? But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and humility and self-control. How different does that sound than bitterness and rage and anger and violent assertiveness and slander and spitefulness? Instead, the Bible says, verse 32, be kind to each other. Tenderhearted. Forgive each other. Just as the Messiah God has also forgiven you. There it is. You can't get away from him. Forgive others because he's forgiven you. You can't get away from him. It's hard to do. Growing up is hard to do. Verse 2 and 3 we talked about and Spirit hung on the word endeavor. Endeavor to keep the unity. Work. Work to keep the unity. My wife made a comment the other day when there was a couple of pastors that had literally sat down that I spoke to this week who others would look at and think they're having revival churches he literally sat down two weeks ago and wrote his resignation letter. He was staring at it. Praying about whether he should turn. Two weeks ago, he, two weeks prior, he had given his great vision to the church. But he said, man, when I gave that, it's like all hell came loose against me. And, 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 and it just seemed to go pumped. So he's writing his resignation letter. And the Lord actually dropped the word of my spirit for him and I called him and gave it to him. So the Lord has called you to build a church. Not to become a wealthy 
entrepreneur business owner. And he said, well, let me tell you. You're the third person that's told me that. He said, well, tell me about this letter. He said, I was staring at that letter going, God, do I? He said, I was crying. And the phone rang. There was another elder who said to him, Brother, God didn't call you to build a business. He called you to build a church. He's not going to leave you or forsake you. And it ain't just the saints to struggle. It's the preachers too. But you've got to endeavor. My wife says this, you know, if it were, e if it were easy, then anybody could do it. And what did the Scripture say? Oh, I'm going along tonight. What did the Scripture say concerning... What did the scripture say concerning uh, unity? Work. Work isn't easy. It doesn't just come. In fact, the scripture tells us that first you receive it by the Spirit, the grace of God, but then you got to endeavor to keep it. Work while I stay because night's coming. There's going to be a fight. You got to fight to keep unity. You gotta want unity more. You gotta want a relationship with God more. You gotta want the things that came of God more than you want those other things. Yes. You gotta be willing to give your brother the benefit of the doubt more than that voice that keeps telling you this and that and the other about that brother. And most of the time you can stop gossip. And bitterness and all that stuff with one simple word communication. You got, let's break it up, you got community and communication, right? You got commune and communication. You got uni and communication. You got unication and communication. Community, union, Unity, communication. He, he is the father of lies. So when the truth begins to communicate with itself, it begins to expose the lies. Because if the truth in you will communicate with the truth in me, we can say, hey, I didn't mean that that way. I'm sorry, I didn't want to come across that way. But I wouldn't be able to say that if you were coming to me and say, hey, well, you did this and such and came across this way. and The devil's been bugging me about it. And I'm going to get it off the chest and I'm going to let the us. But most of the time, we got that little word I in the middle of pride and we don't want to talk about it. Yeah. That little word I. Me, myself, and I. Growing up's hard to do. If it were easy, anybody could do it.